Okay, hour three, going over to Japan, because so much is emanating from that country, not just economically like it used to be, but environmentally, and we're all paying the price, all of us. It's uh, here, it's around the world, uh, it is radioactivity. But even more than that, now we have a change of guard, a new government in Japan, and it is not looking good over there. There is a story I'm going to put up shortly that TEPCO is talking about restarting Fukushima Daiini. Now, that's the sister plant to Daiichi, which is just a stone's throw away. And I don't, I, I, it just boggles my mind. Anyway, to uh, fill us in on, on lots of information is Richard Wilcox, Ph.D., a common a guest uh, and a welcome guest and a writer at Rents.com, and Tony Boys. Uh, first, let's say hello to Richard. Are you there? I am here. Hello to everybody, and have, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you, Richard. Thanks very much. Tony, are you standing by? Yes, Jeff, I'm here. How are you? And I uh, hope your your listeners are all well. Well, they're all out there one way or the other. So, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you uh, both for being here tonight. We have, uh, let's start off with a new government over there. Uh, this this is uh, amazing. I, I remember, as many of our listeners do, how adamant and how fired up and determined and, and inspired the anti-nuclear protest movement was in Japan. And that's coming up on, well, a year and a half ago now. The last demonstration, as I understand it, had around 200 people show up. That was it. In other words, it's over. And many of those people who were demonstrating against nuclear power in Japan apparently voted for the pro-nuclear New government. Uh, tell us more about this. Uh, R- Richard, you first. Okay. Well, uh, I know absolutely the anti-nuclear movement has dwindled. And, you know, last summer they were in front of the prime minister's house making a lot of noise, and there was kind of some hopeful times. Um, but, you know, they waited it out. The government waited it out and wore them down. And, and I, I hadn't. I'm sorry, I haven't read that about the, them voting for the LDP, the no well, it's, new it's, pro-nuclear. It's projected that some of them yeah. did. No way to find out for sure, but uh, right. the number of votes cast would suggest that at least some of those who were at one time anti-nuclear may well have mm-hmm. voted for the personalities, because it's always about personalities, who were running for Absol- office. Absolutely, and th- there wasn't much choice. People voted for the economy. They thought and they were throwing out the uh, other party because they're mad at them and they have short memories. And, uh, yeah, it's probably true. They voted for the personalities, something like that. So some very confusing system for voting and making progress on important issues. Absolutely. What do you yeah. think, Tony, about that? Um, well, I think Jeff must be right about some anti-nuclear people voting for the, uh, for the, um, the, the, the new government. Um, let's give them a name, the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, um, who uh, have have been the government almost uh, continually uh, since about 1955, um, when they first formed their big uh, their their big coalition kind of party. Um, so they've been in power for a long time, um, almost continually up until uh, 2009. Um, when the people who lost this time, that's the Japan, Demo- that's the Democratic Party of Japan, usually called the DPJ, um, won in 2009 after the, uh, the, the financial crisis happened. Um, last year, no, earlier this year, um, I'm, I'm a bit ahead of myself here. Uh, it was reckoned by most opinion polls that about 70 to 80 percent of, uh, Japanese people um, were um, wanted a nuclear phase out, whether it be immediate or um, or over, uh, say a decade or so. Right um, now, if if right, so if uh, seventy to eighty percent of the um, of the population were were supposedly um, well that much anti nuclear, um, then you would think that it would be impossible for a pro nuclear party like the LDP to. Uh, to win the election, but there, are, there you go. They did. Um, so I, I think there's no doubt about um, the fact, um, as you mentioned, um, that some people who are 
in some ways at least uh, anti-nuclear, voted for the pro-nuclear party, the LDP. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have to try and figure out why um, that happened. Um, And one reason was, um, as Rick said, the economy. I think that people... Uh, voted for the LDP because they, they, they feel or they felt, um, that the LDP would be the best people to, uh, run the economy over the next few years. Um, uh, and that's probably based on, on past, um, experience, um, because the LDP were the party who were in power in the sixties and seventies and eighties, um, who ran the economy all that time and, and ostensibly did very well. Um, although these are not those times now, um, we're in a different, we're, we're in a, a totally, we're living in a totally different world now Absolutely. from, from yeah. what it was in the seventies or eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, but people, I think are still people, I mean, the voters are still, uh, looking at the LDP, um, as the party that, uh, managed to, um, do all those economic tricks and miracles, um, in, in the seventies and eighties. Um, and I think the, the other factor is that people who wanted to vote for, um, for an anti-nuclear party, uh, probably couldn't see anywhere to put their vote. Um, there were parties who were <clears throat> running on at least, um, partially a quite strong anti-nuclear platform, but these were, um, first of all, the Japan Communist Party. Um, and I think people would feel um, a little bit of difficulty about switching their vote from from either the DPJ or the LTP to the Japan Communist Party. Um, although, yeah, well, okay. Um, and the other the other options available were were new parties who have just started up. Um, and we might mention those later, but that would be getting into details. Um, one of which is the the so called Mirai Party, the Future Party. Um, which has uh, no future. Which has no future because it's apparently already breaking up. Um, they managed to win a grand total of, of nine seats, I think, in the in the parliament. So you can see that um, even if uh, you, as a voter, if you felt um, some kind of anti-nuclear sentiment, um, that didn't immediately turn turn into. Um, running out and voting for for the most anti nuclear uh, party that that is, existed for one reason or another. Yes, right, right. Tony, yeah. is the is the current political climate in Japan uh, f- fragmented? Then uh, do we have a, a a real strong majority in anybody's corner? It seems like it's kind of all over the map a little bit. Actually, no. Um, it, 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 you're right. It is fragmented. Um, the, although um, you probably know that the the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Democratic Party, did manage to um, get a large majority um, of seats in the um, in the parliament, that right. that that didn't happen because they got a large majority of the votes. Um, they got about um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a low percentage of the actual something like thirty thirty to thirty five percent of the vote. Um, but they, but, um, from that, they got something like 297, 294 seats in the 480 seat, um, diet, the parliament. Um, so it, it's this, um, what we call the, um, the small constituency one past the post election, um, scheme where, um, if, if a, um, candidate gets one more vote than, than the, than the, um, what the candidate who who got the the second amount of votes then then that candidate will get the seat um and that's that's well known everywhere for um probably uh for favoring incumbents and and also for splitting the vote so that um the the, the valid votes uh, in other words the votes cast for the winning candidate um that that wasn't a very good uh, term, really, was it? But because all the votes are valid, the problem mm-hmm. is that thirty two, thirty thirty, or or forty percent of the votes will be enough, uh, even less than that, in some constituencies to elect the candidate. Whereas the the, the remaining sixty or seventy percent of the votes for the other candidates, 
who might be running in the same constituency um, are therefore what are called dead votes um, because they um, the candidates failed. Um, so in that sense, the the, um, the LDP won a lot of seats in the parliament, but it wasn't because they um, they got the majority of votes by by any means at all. Um, so. Uh, in fact, um, public opinion polls before the election, and this, this has always been true for years and years, this is nothing new, um, showed that um, something like 20-something percent of people were going to vote for the LDP, something like 20-something percent, a bit lower than that, or, or about 20 percent would vote for um, the, the DPJ, and then some number of percent would vote for um, other smaller parties. But, but the undecided... Mm -hmm. um, we're about half. So right. the undecided might be 49, 50%. And it's, it's those mm -hmm. people, um, probably most of whom, uh, do not go out to vote anyway. Yeah. Um, who, 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 uh, in effect, they are, they, they are very nearly the majority. If you could get them out to vote, um, yeah. It, yeah. it would make a difference. It's always a um, lot and, of ifs in politics. If well, only, exactly. If yes. Yeah, right. st stand Precisely. by just a second, gentlemen. We have sure. to take a break. We'll come right back. There's a lot of uh, hard data to look at as well uh, in terms of radiation and what's happening to Japan and its people. And its people are suffering. And we'll be right back. Okay, and back with Richard Wilcox and Tony Boyce talking about uh, Japan. Uh, politics in Japan will have a lot to do with what happens to Japan's nuclear industry. All right, Richard, um, one story that... Uh, anything you want to add, uh, by the way, to this, uh, this coverage of the Japan elections? And I want to talk about this U.S. Navy personnel yeah. suit, which is really interesting. Yeah, it is. There's been so many... Uh, news items coming out, and it's just incredible to try to keep up with it. But uh, thank you for posting my article about the election, and I think Tony and I pretty much agree. I wrote a kind of simplified version of it. It's up there. But as the Japan News said, uh, there's been a dissociation from public opinion uh, where the politics don't reflect the, the will of the people, and that's unfortunate. And just a quick, Jeff Kingston, who writes very well about Jeff, Japan politics said, given the unpopularity of the NOTA government and the overwhelming public support for getting rid of nuclear, it's revealing that the Democratic Party of Japan didn't play the anti-nuclear card to woo voters. The reason he suspects, and I think we know, is that they were, uh, they're were they controlled by the nuclear village, what's called the nuclear village or the nuclear mafia or the nuclear industry uh, or nuclear cartel, whichever term you want to use. Uh, that That nuclear... Uh, cartel has so much power over both parties and the media and, and so on and so forth. So uh, even though the they could have played that card and people would have supported them, uh, they said, "Oh no, we don't want to play that card." You know, let it's kind of like when Al Gore th Gore threw the election to Bush, you know, something like that. So yeah, that's just a final thought on mm -hmm. how uh, dismal the political s situation is in Japan. Right. All right. Tell us uh, if you would. And I'll get Tony to comment what the uh, what the lawsuit is about. American sailors on the USS Ronald Reagan who participated in the rescue efforts after the 311 uh, quake and tsunami. That's a very uh, sad story in a way. Not a surprise. The Reagan twice tried to change course to get away from the obvious intense amount of uh, radiation that was being spewed by the wrecked, destroyed plant. And uh, the Reagan sailed right through it, and you know the inside of that ship had to have been full of radioactive air. Yeah, it's terrible, and it's good to see that the a few people, a few uh, sailors, uh, service people are standing up and you know complaining about that because the military usually doesn't allow people to have their own uh, uh, rights. What, you know, if you're in the military, you kind of forfeit your rights. So um, I hope that case will get more 
more uh, press because this this whole nuclear disaster has just been whitewashed and covered over. And um, the more people that get angry and and use every means possible, whether it's the court system or um, however the military justice works, to sue, uh, you know, sue TEPCO or sue the Japanese government or the or the American military if they had a Right. Uh, played, uh, you know, right. responsibility well, for that. Well, a lot of U.S. Uh, naval personnel running rescue, flying, and so forth, received a lifetime dose of radiation during the disaster. Yeah. A lifetime, and then some. And obviously, that poisoning is going to cause suffering and, and cancers in many cases. They, they're, uh, they've shortened their lives, and they're not happy, and, and uh, that's what this is really all about. And they filed suit over this. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know the. Uh, actually, I was looking for that story. I couldn't bring it up. But well, they're, they're we, suing. They're yeah. suing Tepco. Eight members sure. of the. Let me. I'll read a little bit of it for our, our listeners. Eight members, crew members of the USS Ronald Reagan, whose home port is San Diego, sued Tepco in U.S. federal court. The lead plaintiff, uh, Lindsay R. Cooper, claims the uh, Tepco. Personnel intentionally concealed the dangerous levels of radiation in the environment from U.S. Navy rescue crews working off the coast of Japan. The complaint states defended TEPCO and the government of Japan. Both conspired and acted in concert, among other things, to create an illusory impression that the extent of the radiation that had leaked from the site of the Fukushima nuclear power plant was at levels that would not pose a threat to the plaintiffs in order to promote its interests and those of the government of Japan, knowing that the information it disseminated was defective, incomplete, and untrue, while omitting to disclose the extraordinary risks posed to the plaintiffs who were carrying out their assigned duties aboard the USS Ronald Reagan. Bravo to those sailors. I mean, absolutely. They've done their homework, and of course... They feel very damaged by this as, and angry. As well, they, they are damaged by it. Absolutely, uh, they are right. damaged. They don't feel. Da- they may actually feel sick too by the, by this time. Well, imagine but, that that enormous uh, piece of uh, hardware called the USS Ronald Reagan <laughs> taking the air in and forcing it through the forced air ducting throughout the entire ship. How do you decontaminate something like that? That's not easy to do. They may have been in one of those big plumes that Arne Gunderson talked about. You know, 75% of the radiation went out to sea, and they may have caught one of those plumes, and that that's, could have been that's, that's what is thought. Uh, yeah. that's, that's why the ship twice frantically tried to get out of the way of something. They were measuring it all huh. the time. They knew. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Which ties in with this. Um, uh, finally, somebody debunked the WHO study that... Uh, you remember a few weeks ago, the WHO said, uh, not the rock group, but the other one, they said um, that the radiation in Fukushima was no big deal and only 30 people will die or something around the world. and uh, Or was it 130 or something? But um, finally, a doctor in Germany uh, totally ripped that apart, and uh, he's part of a group that said this is biased uh, reporting, uh, they've left out all the pertinent data, et cetera. So, uh, you know, any time the, the TEPCO or the Japanese government or the international apologists try to cover up for this, uh, smart, independent researchers are out there poking holes in it and exposing their lies, and we just need to keep doing that. And I applaud Dr. Rosen, of uh, the German physician, for ripping apart this WHO study, which was just totally bogus uh, methodology and yeah exactly you good know, i that mean was, it's, that was good to see all right stand by yeah, a second so, uh hold on gang we have to take a break we'll do that come right back uh we're on live to japan to tony boyce and richard wilcox
Okay, again, taking a look at at Japan uh, in serious uh, trouble and getting worse. The uh, Tony, the facility, yes. what's left of it at at uh, Fukushima Daiichi is obviously never going to be repaired or even successfully right. dealt with, probably in our lifetime. Now, the sister plant, which is again what a couple hundred yards away. Uh, Daini oh, plant? Oh, no, no, no. It's about, it's about seven miles south. Oh, it's the other two reactors that are uh, uh, nearby. Oh, five and six. Oh, there are two more reactors. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Five and six. On the side. Okay, five but Daini right. is uh, 10 kilometers south, something like that? Yes, that's right. Okay, now that plant was rumored to have sustained damage, but we never really had any verification of it. What do you know about that plant? Now, that, again, is rumored to be on the on the green light for being reopened, uh, which is kind of um, a sh- surprise. Yes. Um, one thing, um, as Rick knows, uh, is that quite recently um, there have been reports that uh, the, the unit one, there are four units, four, four reactors at uh, Daini. Um, the unit one actually had a meltdown, or at least a partial meltdown. So it's correct. It, it's some, something like um, something like Three Mile Island, maybe half the half the nuclear fuel melted, or something like that. So um, the that's not where you go in and starting. shovel it out and start up again either. Ah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, how do you how do you like to do it? Yeah. Um, anyway, excuse me, but um, uh, the the other three, two, three, four uh, units, two, three, four. We don't really know what's going on. Um, all we know, um, as far as I've seen in the mainstream press here, um, is what we knew um, a couple of months after three eleven, um, when they finally decided to tell us what would what had been going on um, in the early days after three eleven. Um, at the Daini plant, and it was it was really very scary. Um, the, all of those four reactors were more or less in a similar state um, to the to the the three the one two three reactors at Daiichi, um, and and it was it was a pretty close thing um, that mm-hmm. those four reactors didn't go down like one two and three did at at uh, Daiichi. Mm-hmm. Um, the, what happened there, and I don't know whether it was because simply the um, the head manager of the plant was a bit a bit cleverer or or uh, um, a bit more what you know active um, than the, the head manager at um, Daiichi, but he managed to um, restore power just in time. By the way, he managed to restore power um, to the nu- that is external power to the nuclear power plant from outside in order to get the cooling systems running again because they had no internal power um, by um, getting a, a self-defense force that's Japan's army self-defense force truck and um, helicopter I think eventually to to lift in a, a, a heavy uh, high voltage cable. Um, to the nuclear power plant so that, that they huh. could link it up with the, the, what, what, uh, nuclear, what, um, excuse me, um, electrical power was available outside at a distance mm-hmm. from the plant where the, um, where the, the, we call pylons, the, the electric towers sure. hadn't fallen over. Right. Um, and if, if they hadn't done that, you'd have seen more or less exactly the same kind of situation in Daini as, as we've seen in Daiichi. Mm-hmm. So it was a very, very close thing. They, they nearly went down. And we, we just didn't know. We still don't know what's going on really inside, but there have been these rumors lately, as you said, that Dai, uh, that Unit 1 in Daini, um, has had at least a partial meltdown. Yeah. 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 The other it's story. Gonna, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the other story that's very uh, interesting and important is that uh, Tokyo is now being proclaimed nearly as irradiated as the Fukushima area. That's that's not good. We ought, we know that Fukushima City really ought to be evacuated. It won't be. It should be. Uh, the uh, uh, um, your yeah, thoughts on that? Uh, I I think I, I well I think what they mean, Jeff, is that there there are areas parts. Um, uh, yeah, we're not talking about the every square right, inch, right? Right, which which are as um, heavily irradiated, as heavily contaminated as parts of, say, Kodiyama and uh, Fukushima City um, in Fukushima Prefecture. Um, and I'd like to say more about this a little bit later, if we if we have time. I'd like to tell you about a 
a meeting I went to at Tokai Village um, on the 24th of December because that links up very nicely with what you're saying there. Good. All right. Okay, uh, Richard, what kind yeah. of medical news are we actually getting? Are we getting the truth about the decline in health among young people in Japan? In fact, people of all ages. Right. That's uh, that's a big, big story, and, and there's just yeah. nothing much being said about it. Right. I think last time we talked, we talked about how the doctors wouldn't listen to the patients who said they had symptoms. They were suspicious, uh, and the nurse would tell them. No, they wouldn't. They just said, no, not, not, yeah. don't go don't somewhere else. No. No. Yeah. And, and we did see the story about the children in Fukushima who are staying indoors, probably wisely, um, but then they're becoming overweight and they must be, you know, they're, they don't, they can't exercise and they're probably depressed. And so then they're snacking on junk food or something. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a feedback loop there of negative, uh, outcomes. And, uh, so the, the, yeah, I'm especially worried about the, the people and the children in the Fukushima region. But even beyond that, I think that, uh, there is this just ongoing concern about, uh, the danger of radiation in food and uh, that I've talked about this and uh, whined about it, I guess, for a long time in the Tohoku and Tokyo regions. Uh, I personally don't want to eat any food that has radiation in it, even if it's a tiny amount. So, but people are eating it. They're, um, they're ignorant. They're being lied to by the government um, and it's being consumed and it's in the fish and everything else. So, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's not. Term. It, the bottom line is, it's not going away, and it's only going to compound yeah. and become more concentrated in time. It accumulates, and I, I just the idea of forcing little children to eat, yeah. uh, irradiated right. rice. I this is. Uh, there was They're one story them. last week also about measuring the environment near one of the incinerators, and there was an attempt to cover up. The results and the incinerator, of course, is is burning radioactive debris. I mean, this is another and just a completely insane policy. I don't understand it. Y- yeah. Um, well, y- y- yeah. Let me let me have a comment yeah, jump, there. Jump, jump, um, jump. Yes, it, it yes, it is insane, and 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 of course, the the government, uh, including the local governments, should be doing much more about this, but they're not. Um, now the the thing about um, radiation, of course, is is that you get um, acute um, symptoms from ex- from high levels of external radiation. But then later, what happens is that the internal radiation that people have, have got inside them from breathing and, as you say, from from eating contaminated food, the the health effects from these are not going to appear until something like two to five years after the after 311 exactly and after the event yeah. all right so so right. we're not actually seeing anything now or we're not seeing very much now well um, uh, yeah and we're... And, that, and that's because it, it's not quite time for those things to appear yet they now, will. What will happen they will and and what will happen uh, when they do um, I'm sure there will be a lot of a lot of cover-ups and things like that. But I think Rick is also aware at the same time that there have been several um, studies of uh, children in Fukushima and probably um, in northern Ibaraki here um, in Iwaki City of, um, of children's thyroids. Um, and they have shown that, that there have been far, far more abnormalities in those yeah. thyroids than, yeah. than have, the, right. I think so, it's, so we, I saw 40% yeah, so, somewhere, uh, it was exactly. too much, way too much. It's far just, more. Uh, Tony, course, hold on, please. We, yes, we do okay. have to pause just for a sure. moment. We'll come back and pick that up in just a minute. Okay, let's get right back to conversation. All right, Tony, go ahead, please. Yes, hello. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, okay, so we, we've, ha- we've had thyroid problems, I think, already appearing. The pro-nuclear people um, have, have tried to play it down by saying, oh, uh, well, you're seeing these thyroid abnormalities because the thyroid testing that they're doing now is much more accurate than it used right. to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. And things like this. So, mm-hmm. um, but, but I think we're definitely... 
we're definitely seeing it. It, it certainly looks like that from the studies that have appeared. Uh, and and, and um, unfortunately, that's going to get worse. Um, and, and that appears in, in children and teenagers, basically. Um, now, the, the, the internal um, radiation problem, as, as I said, the, even the doctors are saying, well, you won't see very much of that until two to five years after the, the, uh, the, the, the disaster occurred. And then after that, for, for about another 20 years, maybe, you're going to see people come out with all kinds of cancers. But um, if you don't mind, I'd just like to mention this um, uh, meeting that happened in Tokai Village, which is very close to me, um, about 15 kilometers away from where I am. Yes, go ahead. Um, this happened on the 24th. Um, I want to tell you first that Tokai Village is like the nuclear village in Japan. It had Japan's first um, first commercial reactor. And also, um, your listeners may just remember that in 19, September 1999, um, there was a famous uh, accident there, the JCO accident, where um, uh, workers in a uh, some kind of uranium enrichment plant were sloshing around very highly enriched uranium in buckets, and suddenly it went critical, and two of the workers died. Um, so this is the this is your famous uh, Tokai village. Now, we said earlier that the, the, uh, the very pro-nuclear LDP party won the election. And uh, does this mean the, the end of um, uh, anti-nuclear uh, campaigning in Japan? And, and I think this meeting told us that very in, emphatically it is not the end. Um, the, the meeting was held in a hall, probably built with uh, nuclear power money, um, in uh, Tokai village, um, and the hall seats 800 people, and it was packed out. Um, and there were, there were uh, not many, but there were some people standing or sitting in the aisles as well. And the people talking there, um, were the mayor of that, of that village, who is, who is now anti nuke. Um, uh, uh, another mayor from a city near Hamaoka nuclear power plant, which people may know of. Um, it's also very famous for accidents. And also, um, a Professor Koide, who is very famous here, um, as a, as a, a professional. Um, yeah, I've, I've quoted a scientist. number of his, yes, uh, okay. his pieces. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, he was there too, and he spoke. Um, and I just want to, to tell you two of the things that, uh, the, the interesting highlights of the things that they said. Um, Professor Koide, for example, said, um, uh, or asked, how, how would you protect people from radiation? And this is very interesting. The next thing he said is protect children. He said, in a sense, adults don't matter because they're far less sensitive to the effects of radiation. And he showed a graph from, from John Goffman's book. Um, forget the name of it. From John Goffman's book called uh, Radiation and Human Health. He showed a graph where it shows that, that babies are very, very sensitive and people who are over 50 are almost totally uh, non-sensitive to, to uh, uh, ionizing radiation. So therefore, what should you be doing? All right, You have to decontaminate, decontaminate places where children spend a lot of time, find and decontaminate local hotspots, especially where people play. And he said also that food standards, right, contamination standards for food are pretty useless. For example, Japan has some uh, standards which are about 100 becquerels per kilogram. Um, but then do we say it's okay for people to eat uh, food, which is 99 um, becquerels per kilogram? Of course not. So what are we going to do with the children? Are we, what we have to do is we have to measure every piece of food that we're, that we're going to eat somehow and then give the children the cleanest while the adults eat the, the more contaminated food. And actually, that's what happened in, in areas around Chernobyl. Um, it, and it, it may even still be happening there, actually, uh, with, with the richer people buying in food from, uh, from areas which were not contaminated so that they would be able to eat less contaminated or non-contaminated clean food. Um, and he said that all of this can and should be done by people and community power. And as far as possible, uh, sensitive people, um, that means children, for example, uh, well, all young people, um, pregnant women and so on, should be, should be evacuated from contaminated areas. Um, the, the problem is that um, the Japanese government is doing almost none of this stuff, which is why he recommends that, that uh, private people and, and uh, communities and organizations do it. 
Um, but the, one of the problems here is what do you call a contaminated area? Um, where would you be evacuating people from? And he gave the, the, um, the example of the uh, inside of the um, research reactor where he works. So he knows a lot about this. Um, and he said that his um, research reactor um, is a restricted area. And that means that um, it may be contaminated up to 40,000 becquerels per square meter inside wow. the reactor. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. And that's, that's, that's kind of okay. Um, but people outside, okay, and not, not, you can't just go in there. You have to have special permission to go in there. Uh -huh. And then the other thing is if, that if you're in there and you're trying to get out, you must prove before you go out that you are not as contaminated as this 40,000 becquerels <laughs> per square meter. Right. And if you are, you have to wash or whatever you do. And he, he emphasized the fact that this is the law. It, that that is the legal situation, but it so happens that about ten percent of the main island of of uh, Japan called Honshu, and that would be about five, just over five percent of the whole of Japan, is actually now contaminated to a higher level than that forty thousand becquerels per square meter. So the government, by law, should be evacuating all the people from those areas, which would include at least parts of of Fukushima City and Koryama City and and many other places in um, in Fukushima Prefecture. So he said that the, this situation where the government is refusing to uh, evacuate people from these areas is is actually an illegal situation. These people are actually, by their own laws, criminals, and they should be put in jail. And and that would include, of course, all the the academics and the the mass media people who have been backing up. Um, nuclear power in uh, over the years and the business people and everybody else who says that basically they're all criminals. And he got a big round of applause for that, I can tell you. It was very, very interesting. Um, another um, thing, another one thing I'd like to mention um, from from the uh, Tokai village, um, uh, where they called it a nuclear summit from this meeting, um, was that the... Um, uh, the mayor Mikami from the uh, city near the Hamaoka nuclear power plant, mm -hmm. he asked the um, um, he asked the audience, um, if you were the if you were the uh, president of Mongolia, would you accept um, a certain <laughs> amount of money? Well, how much was yeah. this? How um, much? What's your price? Right. He said, would you would you accept? Um, would you accept $235 million a year for storing all of Japan's nuclear waste on your land? Mm. And nobody put their hands up. Maybe one person put their hand up as a joke. But then, of mm -hmm. course, the people knew that they weren't supposed to put their hand up. So, um, but, but this, um, uh, this calculation is very interesting um, because basically um, Japan's uh, 50, as they are now, um, and, and most of them are not running. Only two of them are running at the moment. They're all paying out um, about $4.7 million per year, each of them, um, towards uh, final, um, final uh, what do we call it, um, a final repository for, for their nuclear waste, for Japan's nuclear waste. But it doesn't like, look like they're going to be able to do it here. Um, so they're, they're trying to find people like Mongolia, who have actually already refused to do it. Yes, well, that, that was talked right, about right. some time ago. The thing and, is, of yeah. course, that, that, that this uh, $235 million per year would have to be a 100,000-year contract. That's exactly right. So, yes. So the whole thing would cost in U.S. dollars. Well, let me get to the end. The whole thing would cost in U.S. dollars $23.5 trillion. Ha! <laughs> Funny. Uh, yeah, right. so, so how come, how come nuclear humor. energy is cheap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Go ahead, Richard. I just got a punchline for him. I couldn't wait. <laughs> $23 trillion um, in 100,000 years, right? I mean, people will be around then. I mean, that's it's absurd. And... uh the other funny thing that uh, Professor Koide said was, I wasn't there, but I, I looked at Tony's notes, right. and he said, tofu, do you like tofu? All of Japan's nuclear power plants are basically built on geological tofu. Since virtually all the land in Japan is like tofu, there's no appropriate place to build them, and therefore anywhere is okay. And if anywhere you don't know is okay, tofu, right, yeah. So if you don't know what tofu is, like jello. Everybody you know, knows so tofu? 
Mm-hmm. So the the new LDP, there these guys are completely insane. Uh, they're evil. They're corrupt. Um, I think they're Satanists. Uh, they're they're bought off. Um, Ishihara's son is going to be the new head of the environment department or the um, uh, head of the nuclear thing, whatever it is. Um, all of the all of the bureaucrats in the uh, nuclear regulatory things. They just switched from two other organizations, NISA and another one, and they became NRA, uh, which is all the, exactly the same people. It's like 460 people moved from one to the next. And, um, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe they have been a little bit critical of some things, which is good, but uh, they're going to end up going along. And so all of these reactors are going to be restarted in the future, it appears, unless people do something to stop it. And another earthquake is going to come and cause another disaster. So that's where we are. It's terrible. Yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, again for the update. Uh, Things not looking any better over there, unfortunately, as we begin the year 2013. Take care. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, Tony. Thank you, Richard. All right. And that's our program tonight. We'll be right back with you tomorrow, uh, Friday night. Hope to have you along. Have a good day tomorrow. Take care. And we'll talk then.